community organizations and with the public at large. Um, of course, um, I would I would always be available as a sounding board uh, when needed. Um, functionally, I've been looking at ways to streamline our meetings, uh, particularly particularly um, committee and elected representatives presentation to free up more time for board discussion and for public discussion. Uh, finally, in asking for your vote, um, I would like, I'd like you to do two things. To consider my experience and what I've achieved on the board, uh, my professional experience, particularly my legislative experience, and of course, my, my residence, my lifetime residence almost, on the Upper West Side and my concern for the Upper West Side. And I want to address one last issue, which is term limits. Um, as Mark knows, and we've discussed it three times, uh, I have great respect for Mark. Uh, but I do agree that, as, as is stated in our bylaws, we, uh, I'll wrap it up, I'm sorry. To provide the greatest opportunity for every member of the board to serve in these capacities. So I ask you to consider that when you vote. Thanks. Okay, those were uh, pretty thorough. And you also have uh, your written statements by the candidates. Uh, but there's a time now for question and answer. If there's anything that you specifically want to drill down into the board members, any questions, you can ask any candidate. Hi, thank Elizabeth. You. Thank you, and again, I want to thank Roberta for her service for the last few years. And this is obviously a role that we, I think all 50 members of us care a lot about, so I appreciate all three of you running. I chaired the board for three years um, before Roberta. So my question is really asking each of you if, you, if it's possible to ask for a response, just maybe one sentence each on an example of demonstrable leadership during your service on Community Board 7 that best represents why you would be the best chair. Anyone want to answer in one sentence? Jay? Can I put in a lot of commas and make it a very... It's, it's, it, it really is very hard to, to do that in... Uh, one sentence. I, as far as a concrete an issue, an issue. An, an issue? that you've led. Okay. Um, I, I would say, at, in terms of a concrete result, it would be uh, the issue that we created a task force on sustainability uh, a, a couple of years ago, where I drafted a bill, had it introduced by our assembly member. Uh, pointed her to a co-sponsor, and so far have gotten it passed in the state senate, and it's waiting to be passed in the assembly. Mark, yep. Can you I can. Um, so the issue that I would offer you is small storefront rezoning. There was an initiative that was started by our land use committee to limit the size of storefronts as a means to try to preserve mom and pop stores. We all know instances of uh, stores that were arrogated together and eliminating small businesses. And the, uh, the effort started with the Land Use Committee to try to limit the size of these small storefronts and the spread of Duane Reeves and so forth. Um, it fell to me when I became chair to try to push this across the finish line. And the, um, and the chair of the City Planning Commission looked to me to say, not only must this pass your board, but it must pass by a wide margin. We conducted a great process, ended up with a successful rezoning that achieved the purposes we set out to do. It has not had all the success that we want because we are still plagued with small storefronts that are vacant, but it is what our board can do and speak in the language of a community board to try to do it. Amy. I think mine is still ongoing. Uh, I'm working with Louisa on uh, getting an urban fellow to look at infilling and the senior population in our <laughs> housing communities and how that affects new families moving in, as well as how or how not it could be profitable 
to the housing uh, neighborhoods, uh, NYCHA, to have these private fair market buildings on their property and how that could help sustain and change some of the issues that NYCHA is having in regards to infrastructure and the, uh, all of that. I'd also say since I've only been on the board twice, my second meeting when I joined the board, I was asked to be secretary. I stood up and said, of course. And then the following year, I was voted into first chair. So I definitely have been on the executive committee. I've also been quietly talking to our chair over the last two years, working through things. I'm a true believer in doing it privately and not necessarily publicly when I don't agree with things that are happening. Thank you. Any other questions? Maybe repeat. I would just ask you, candidate, I think right now it's not working where we just give the public one minute to speak. And often the public needs to be more mean feeling like they sat here for two and a half hours and they weren't able to say what they wanted to say. And they haven't sort of, and I'm not, I respect the fact that we have, you know, only here in limited amount of time. But I would ask you to speak to the prospective chair. Limit your answers to one minute. <laughs> I do think it's an issue. I think that with more notice to the committee meetings where those issues are being talked and public and board members, whether you're on the committee or not, can come forth and have conversations and dialogue there. It would limit how much of that dialogue needs to happen in these board meetings. I um, also believe that I think it's a question for steering committee, for the chairs, and for the chair of the board and executive to really look at. And it might be something that the bylaws committee we also want to look at. I do not want anyone to walk out of here feeling that they haven't been heard. I've been battling that for years with a population who does not feel they have a voice. So I want to ensure that everyone feels a voice. And sometimes it may mean picking a new venue if there's a curfew. Okay. Uh, sure, thanks. So one of the advantages or one of the benefits of having had the chance to speak with so many of you is that I've heard two things that are sort of pretty much relevant to this but diametrically opposed. Folks that are very concerned about meetings that go on longer than they may need to and folks who want to make sure that we hear from folks. I know personally folks who used to come to every public session but don't because one minute is too far to travel with a walker and the M104 bus. So it is a balancing act, to be sure. I am not wedded to one minute by any means, but I'm also not, uh, not inclined to have meetings that run past 11 o'clock at night. A careful meeting management, and there are some tools, Jay has uh, suggested a couple, I'm gonna suggest a couple. We'll, we'll have some interesting discussions, a steering committee um, about ways in which we can manage time. Um, my goal is to make sure that everybody, both my colleagues on the board and the folks that are in the audience get heard, maybe only once that you get heard, so say everything you've got, and we probably all will need to push to have a little more advanced preparation, but those are the ways in which, along with, and this is the last point I'll offer, um, folks walk away from our meetings not feeling heard, not necessarily because they didn't have the mic in their hands, but because of the way in which we interact with them. And so I wanna introduce as much empathy as we have time, and I think that focusing on the empathy will solve the time problem, thanks. Uh, Jeanette, I, I, I agree absolutely that uh, this is uh, something that we need to address. Um, uh, time management is challenging, but as Mark mentioned, I have a couple of things. When, when I first came on the board, um, the public was given two minutes speaking time and somewhere along the line that got cut to one. I think it's worth at least a, a, a trial period in restoring the two minutes. The other thing is I, I think we can streamline some of the committee presentations and some of the uh, elected officials' representatives' presentations. The time is precious and if we can manage, if we can manage to cut 10 or 15 or 20 minutes off that time, that's a lot of speaking time for the public. Pub many people come here, they get a chance once a month, and virtually all the people that come here to speak are, are letting us know about problems 
that affect their lives very personally and very seriously. And, and, and I, I really think that's a priority. We, we cannot uh, have an atmosphere where people are either shy about speaking up, people on the board, or reluctant to do so, reluctant to come to our meetings for fear of being cut off. So I, I definitely would make that a priority. And as Mark said, I already have some ideas to see if we can focus on that problem and make it better. Any other questions? Kathy? Give me a mic. Um, I, okay. <laughs> Yeah, right. Something I really appreciate about the board is that there's so many diverse perspectives. So I was wondering if you could each give an example of how you were able to bring together people on the board with dissenting views on a contentious issue um, in order to achieve something concrete, such as a resolution or an action. Why don't we start with Mike since Mark okay. since the mic on me. Okay, here I am. So I have to think while I'm standing, right? Um, OK, so perhaps one that I'll offer you is um, it, the following. When I was chair of the Youth and Education and Libraries Committee once upon a time, there was a proposal to introduce a charter school into a high school building. And there was um, an effort to, um, to resist it on a number of different levels, some of which had to do with the safety of the children and the different sizes of kids that would be interacting and so forth. Some of it was financial. Some of it was um, uh, a, a resistance among some folks to the whole notion of charter schools. And what we, uh, and the Youth Education and Libraries Committee actually proffered a resolution that in the course of the discussion, I withdrew. And I withdrew it because it didn't accurately or completely reflect all of the different points of view on our board at that time. This is a bunch of years ago now. Um, and perhaps that's why I'm dragging up this, this example. What we did was we brought it back to committee. We conducted a public hearing. We had all of the voices we could think of and with my personal assurance that there would be a safe environment in which to uh, present, the, uh, the charter school operator actually came and presented and there was some meeting of the minds. There's, uh, there's only so much that Macy's is gonna tell Gimbel's and vice versa. Um, but what we ended up with was a, a resolution that passed our board 40 to nothing. And I think that that shows that we were able to bring as much commonality in a contentious issue as was there to be had and to let fall by the wayside those things that where we didn't have common ground. I think that's the best answer I can give you. About a year ago, we had term limits on chairs of our committees. And um, it was contentious, but there's one in particular committee that was being broken up by the chair because one of the people that she had appointed to be chair could no longer serve as chair because it was a conflict of interest with her employer. Um, the committee felt very strongly about keeping this committee together and how important the work was in keeping this committee together. And uh, meeting with them, we were able to, I think it took us about two hours, to get all of our points across, to get why this was so important. And I was set with the task to go back to the chair and ask her to understand where the committee stood and why they stood there, and to change her opinion on what she was doing. Um, it was not an easy place to be. No one wants to be stuck between a rock and a hard place. But I do think that I went back and advocated for the committee on very clearly on what they had said and what their priorities were. I think I became, um, you know, and I was able to change the chair's um, viewpoint on it, and the committee still stands as a whole doing excellent work. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> a couple of years ago, um, as a result of a couple of tragic accidents that we had uh, up on 96 and 97th Street in West End and Broadway, um, Helen Rosenthal came before this board uh, and, and brought a proposed bill for us to consider um, 
and, and the recommendation of the Transportation Committee at the time um, was that we support the bill. Um, Helen approached me before the meeting because she had heard that I was going to speak in opposition to the bill, which uh, quickly was, was a bill that ha uh, involved taxi drivers involved in, ac in accidents with serious injuries, and the bill uh, would have mandated that if there was an accident with a serious injury, the cab driver's license would have been suspended summarily uh, without a hearing, without any due process. Uh, I got up and I spoke against the bill. I felt it was inherently unfair, um, probably unconstitutional, and um, as a result, um, our board reversed the decision uh, after much discussion, because frankly, we were all interested in, in promoting safety as we are with many issues. Uh, but then I, I worked with Helen, uh, we met, and she revised the bill and ultimately came up with a fair bill that passed the city council and became law. Hands. I have a question. Of course, I'm not looking. <laughs> I don't need a microphone. It's, it's fine. Hi. So every year, a handful of spots open up on our board, and so I would love to hear the candidates' thoughts on recruitment of new members and specifically how they plan to recruit members that reflect the vibrant diversity of our community. Me? Okay. Okay. Uh, first thing to know is that um, while recruitment is within our power, um, it is the elected officials who, who run this process. So um, we're grateful, I think all of us are grateful that, um, that the elected officials do reach out and ask our views, but they are, uh, but I, I, I talked sure. before about being advisory, this is truly advisory. It is their, their job and we respect that of them. Of that, I would say that um, um, since I um, hope to be leaving the Preservation Committee, my hope is that we would find somebody who would, would work with that. But speaking more globally, um, it is a, an important thing to make sure that we have geographic balance in our district. And there may be areas in our district, and I think we should keep track of this, not just take it as a snapshot in time, but as a fluid thing, to make sure that the various different communities, each very different one from another, and each within uh, with, with very different needs one from another are fairly represented on our board. I want to make sure that our board represents all of the rich diversity of our district on the Upper West Side and the districts that sort of abut it closely and therefore inform how we do our work and what our experience here is like. And I think that has to include folks who work here as well as folks who live here. <laughs> I agree with everything Mark said, but I'm going to give some concretes. I think it's important that we get into the parent associations in all of our schools, especially above 100th Street. Introduce what a community board is. Show them you know, what we do and how we do it. Have them apply for it. I think that is the most underrepresented part of this district in this board and sometimes in our conversations. <laughs> I think it's also about getting out to the Ryan centers and those type places, marketing ourselves well. Make sure that we're co-sponsoring with all the events that are going on. Make sure that all of us, not just one of us, is out there showing our face and being proud to be part of this community board and telling other people why it's important that they're on it. The reality is we're all here for eight years, some of us 10, but it means that we're moving on and our seats need to be filled. And I think it's really important that we present opportunities to mentor that new class. Okay. Yeah, obviously, I agree with Mark and I agree with Anne uh, that uh, diversity is key. Um, frankly, um, in, this, in this process involving this election, um, I wasn't sure how it would feel to reach out to so many of you individually. I've never been involved in a political campaign uh, and done this before. But whatever the result is, I've really enjoyed uh, having a one-on-one -on -one discussion with so many of you and learning about your backgrounds and your work and, and getting your ideas. And one of the things that I think I would have to do, because I'm not totally familiar with 
with, with the board as a whole and where you come from, what you're interested in, is to try and continue that process, meet with as many people as possible and get some feedback from the board as to what we need uh, on this board to really broaden the opinions that we get and the viewpoints that we get. So the first thing for me would be a learning process. And then whatever impact we could have with our elected officials and with the borough president, uh, then we can exert more. to vice chair, co-chair, uh, and again, as a result of lots, uh, Cindy will go first, and then Doug, and, so, I, I'm sorry, <laughs> Doug, and then Cindy, and then Andy. You want to stay there? And then just pass it on to Cindy. Sure. Um, hello, everybody. I just want to say what an honor this is to be here. I am extremely proud to serve on this board. Born and raised in this neighborhood and uh, 54 years here. So I am very proud of not only um, all the nominees tonight, which I, I, I'm in great company with, but every single board member here, and I'm not kissing up, this is absolutely true, would have said this before the nomination or not. I'm so proud of everybody's service here. 50, or 50 odd uh, board members, and when I think about the collective experience that we all have, it, if I do my math correctly, we're into the hundreds, maybe thousands of years here. <laughs> that is extraordinary. Every one of us has a particular skill set, life experience, and point of view, and I think we all need to celebrate that and actually um, mine more for it, um, as in coal mining, mine for it, because each one of us has something to add. And I, don't, and I think that we need to learn more about each other and call upon each other. I would like to see this board, this is a bit of a public service announcement, I'd like to see this board to be a little bit kinder and gentler. I think it's very important, we owe that to the community. I'd like to see that happen. I think that we should listen more and talk less. That is a, set, uh, a skill set that I continue to learn every day. I've learned that in my personal life, this is personal experience, business, and obviously our civic duties, listening is so important because how can we address something if we keep talking over what is being said? So it's extremely important that we listen to each other as a board and the community who is here. 230,000 people and everybody has different points of view as well and needs, we can triage those needs. Some needs are emergencies. Some of the issues that we're talking about this evening some are longer term and some are mid-level. So it's extremely important for us to listen to everybody. Um, I want us to be more proactive and, and not as much reactive. That means going out into the community, reaching out to everybody in every part of our community in our district. That means every socioeconomic background, every gender. I'd like to see more outreach into NYCHA. Um, middle income, High income, we're all here in it, we're all in it together, and we need to reach out to all stakeholders, everybody that lives here and works here. Um, basically, um, you know, the, the board, we had a process on the interview, uh, which some people said was campy, but it was very interesting to me. There was an exercise for those of us who applied and reapplied, where you're stuck on a deserted island and you have a certain number of uh, resources at your disposal. And the, the whole lesson behind that was that when we all make a decision together, we actually make a better decision. So I would like to see a, a more of a collective conscience here, understanding what is better for the greater good and not pushing our personal agendas as much. I see our time is up. So I wanna see more of the true grassroots democratic process in our board, and I vow to do that. Thank you. I'm Cindy Cardinal, running for vice chair. Um, I live on 77th and Riverside with my husband and my 25-year-old son, who is a stagehand and hoping to move to a place of his own, as are we. Um, we, also, we also have a daughter who is a 29-year-old journalist who lives in Kevlar in Washington, D.C., and a 27-year-old daughter who is a, the market strategist for a fashion and lifestyle website, and she lives in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. My background is labor and employment law. 
I worked in a couple of uh, New York City law firms in Midtown before we moved to Toronto, Ontario, where we relocated with our eldest daughter and lived for seven years. Uh, at that point, we had two more kids, and, and I worked as an employment law human resources consultant for about 20 years. After we moved to Manhasset on Long Island, I continued to consult until I became a legislative aide to a Nassau County legislator. And when she was elected supervisor of the town of North Hempstead, uh, which has about 25, 250,000 people, um, I became her chief of staff. Uh, this is the eighth board on which I've served. I've served on a number of nonprofit boards and I was elected to three terms or nine years uh, on the Manhasset Board of Education, and I finished a term on the Manhasset Library Board of Trustees. Through my board service, I gained experience drafting and revising bylaws, approving budgets, and setting policy. On the Board of Education, I established a policy committee. I served as president for six years and was the first chair of our Citizens Advisory Committee for Legislative Affairs. My work in government included drafting legislation, working with community groups, and supervising the managers of the town's Parks Department, Community Services, Department of Services to the Aging, Business Tourism Development, and uh, acting as project manager for our, our, my brother's Keeper Mentoring Initiative in coordination with President Obama's administration. Since join, joining CD7 in May of 2018, I've served on the Parks and Environment Committee. This year I chaired the Budget and Strategy Strategy Committee, where along with my fellow committee members, uh, Mark and Roberta and Penny, um, we have sought to get uh, input to have a transparent and inclusive process and actively seek input from our committee chairs. Um, I've al I also serve on the bylaws, senior citizens and communication task forces, and the steering and personnel committees, and I served on the communications and election committees last year on this board. In other words, I've tried to say yes to every opportunity that was given to me to, to serve. As vice chair, I would strive to be inclusive and transparent with my fellow board members and community at large, seeking to improve communication both among the board and with the broader community. I think that we as a board can improve, that we can be more civil and respectful to each other and function more cohesively. And as vice chair, I would try to work to help us move in that direction. I came to this board with no agenda other than to serve our community, to be responsive and to advocate for our neighbors, and I will continue to work hard to fulfill my responsibilities. I think my many years in professional and community service provide me with unique tools to understand the needs and preferences of various, sometimes competing stakeholders and constituencies, and to work closely with multiple levels of government and government agencies simultaneously. Our third speaker is Andrew Riggi. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. So I am Andrew Riggi. It's been a pleasure for the past year to serve as the second vice chair. And I had a lot of encouragement by many of you to run again, so here I am. I can say last year when I ran, I made one campaign promise. And that one campaign promise has been fulfilled. Thank you very much to Penny and the whole team, which are the 